Hey everybody, welcome to Adapter Parish. This week we are of course going to be talking about J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, but I wanted to talk to everybody before we get started about a couple of things. First of all, as always, your continued support is just meaning the world to us. Uh, this has been super, super fun. This is episode four that we are releasing right now, and the response has been really fantastic. We have received, I think at this point, more than one angry text message in the last couple weeks or so uh, about when uh, the next episode is going to be coming out. Um, and of course, today is the day for episode number four, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Um, the other thing I wanted to say before we get started, of course, is to let you know what our next episode is going to be. In the next episode, we are going to be talking about Fogons. We are going to be talking about infinite improbability drives. We're going to be talking about paranoid androids. We are going to be talking about how digital watches are a pretty neat idea. And of course, we're going to be talking about how important it is to know where your towel is. Of course, we are going to be talking about Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, it is one of my favorite books, and we are super excited for everybody to hear it in about two weeks. I say about exactly two weeks, every other Tuesday. That's our schedule. We're, we're making this thing work, and we're very excited about it. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with Adapter Parish and J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Bye, everybody. Everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Adapter Parish. Are My name is Jeremy Latour. Are we recording? Yeah. <laughs> this is episode number four. We're still working the kinks <laughs> out. I need a red light that goes on like in old movies. Hello and welcome to Adapter Parish. <laughs> My name is Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. Welcome to this week's episode. This is a podcast where we talk about adaptation. Yeah, we talk about turning things into other things. And today we're going to be talking about... The Hobbit. Yes. Yeah. Friends, we consumed a lot of content. There was a, We did so much for you, our so, listener. So much. So we just hope that there's one person out there who's going, Yay, The Hobbit, my favorite thing! Because what did we do? We each read the book, we The read Hobbit. The, we read the, for the first time in my life. I listened to the book. Mm -hmm. I listened to the audio book of mm -hmm. it because I've read it a, a number of times. Right. Yeah. Um. And we also watched the. You know what year is that cartoon version? From? 1977. We watched the 1977 animated cartoon. Mm -hmm. We also watched the 20 teens. Yes. Trilogy of the Hobbit. Approximately nine hours of Hobbit. And Hobbit-related content. It's It was a lot. It was a lot. It was quite a bit. And a comic book. Right. Yeah. Right. And a comic book. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a lot of Hobbit content, and mm -hmm. uh, I think we should get into it. I think we should get right into it. Great. So um, this is a book, I, I can just speak for myself here for a second. Uh, this is a book that I read a bunch when I was a kid. Um, I still have never made it all the way through The Lord of the Rings. So um, I have made it all the way through The Lord of the Rings. Yep. Uh, including the Silmarillion. Mm. Uh, but I... Apple Polisher. What? Apple Polisher. Right. Well, I had read The Hobbit, but never really got into it because I thought that it was boring. <laughs> and okay. now, having consumed a great deal of Hobbit-related content in a short time... I still think it's a little boring. I I mean, here's the deal. That's a really that's a harsh statement. I mean, it's harsh coming right out of the gate because I don't because I'm about to talk for 90 minutes about The Hobbit, so like it's kind of rude to be like it's boring, but I'm going to talk about it. Yeah, we're like three minutes into the episode. Yeah, and it's already gotten uh, the B label. Okay, well, I have a lot of thoughts anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but no, I actually am a pretty big Lord of the Rings fan mm -hmm. i would say i came to it a little bit late i came to it pretty much around the time the movies started coming out so i would have been in late high school at that time and my issue and this may come up with other properties that we talk about oh different ip different ip 
um, different uh, content that we talk about on this podcast. My issue with fantasy uh, or even some science fiction has always been that I have a really hard time picturing what's happening in my head and so I get really confused and then tune out. So I had tried to read The Hobbit, I tried to read The Lord of the Rings, I never really was successful because I didn't understand what was happening. And then I saw the first Lord of the Rings movie, Fellowship of the Ring, when I was, because my dad really likes Lord of the Rings, so he was really excited about it and we got it like on VHS or whatever Mm -hmm. when it came out. Actually, I think it was DVD at that time, but it was still like letterbox DVD, whatever. Right. It was special. Um, Right. Yeah. And um, sat down and watched the movie with my dad and suddenly I had an image in my head for all of the characters. So immediately was like, oh my God, this is great. And I went and I read all three books, like Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King Mm -hmm. immediately and was super hooked. And so that's my relationship with my relationship is primarily with Lord of the Rings. I don't have a strong relationship with The Hobbit yeah. necessarily. And my, my relationship is super, super different than yours because my relationship basically started when I was a little kid. My dad had like the big red leather bound Lord of the Rings edition. You've seen it before, right? Maybe. It's it's great. Like you can still get it. It's the same edition that's been around for years. He always had that and he had a copy of the Silmarillion. And I would always look at it and go like, what's the Lord of the Rings? And he go, okay, cool. Here's the thing. There's this thing called The Hobbit. That's, that's for you. Um, that's what you're going to like, you, uh, tiny child. And so I, I honestly at this point can't remember if the first time I ever experienced The Hobbit was watching the 1977 cartoon or my dad reading it to me. But that that's my earliest experience of it. Yeah. I Yeah, because I just remember my dad saying, well, the, the Hobbit is a children's book, like in a dismissive tone. Right. And, and as we're going to get into, I think The Hobbit is a children's book, but I think that's great. Right. That's one of the things I love about it. Right. So I loved The Hobbit when I was a little kid. Um, it, I, it was exciting and it was funny and it scared the crap out of me um, for one specific reason. And it was always something that I shared with my dad. Right. That was a thing he was really into. It was a thing I was really into. And I read The Hobbit a bunch of times when I was a kid. I tried reading Lord of the Rings, but I couldn't really get into it. But talking about Tolkien was something that happened in my house a lot. Mm-hmm. That came up a lot because my dad read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and read The Silmarillion and like would tell me all the things that were in it. Even though I didn't read it myself, it was something he imparted to me, which was really, really nice. Right. And then I remember seeing the very first like teaser for the lord of the rings for the movie Mm -hmm. but it wasn't even like a teaser teaser it was a little thing saying we are making this movie the special effects like special effects are finally what they need to be in order to make this movie and i remember watching it going we're gonna get a lord of the rings movie because the only thing i'd ever gotten when i was a kid was there was the hobbit cartoon Mm -hmm. There was the Ralph Bakshi Lord, Lord of, the of the Rings. Which I have on DVD. Which is basically just Fellowship of the Ring. Yes, I'm pretty sure. Because it didn't do well and they didn't make any more. Right, right, right. I've heard that. And then the people that made The Hobbit went back and made Return of the King. Right. So it's weird. If you only want to watch the cartoons, you can watch The Hobbit in one style. Then basically Fellowship of the Ring in a in another style. Not the and Two Towers. Not that, the Two that Towers. That does not exist. That's gone. And then Return of the King in the original style. I think that's why I was so confused mm-hmm. when you said let's watch The Hobbit because I was thinking it was Ralph the Ralph Bakshi thing. And so the animation style was totally different. So I was really yeah. confused because I was familiar with the Ralph Bakshi mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so let's talk about The Hobbit. Like, I mean, people might not know what The Hobbit is. Let's, let's quickly discuss that. The Hobbit is one of the things I love. So I love the story of The Hobbit. And I love it for one big reason it's just so simple it's a to b it's the story of a hobbit named bilbo baggins right and it has i'm gonna go ahead and say it has my favorite opening line from a book ever right in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit it is perfect it's absolutely perfect because that's all you need to know the great thing is, you know, there's so much lore in Lord of the Rings and there's so much lore of Middle Earth that Tolkien created, but The Hobbit is where it all started. Right. And and we should say the author of The Hobbit is... J.R.R. Tolkien. J.R.R. Tolkien. Yep. He was a British man. He was an Oxford professor of like language and linguistics, mm-hmm. I believe. And He basically created an entire 
fantasy so that he could make languages for all of the right. races in the world. Right, which is cool. Yeah. And that's the thing that I like. Like, I, that's the thing that appeals to me a little bit more is sort of the cerebral aspect. Of the like academic of, aspects of it. Yeah, just all of yeah. the stuff that he created mm-hmm. and not so much, I guess. So let's put it this way. When I was a little kid, like, you are a Mr. Rogers person. Yes. Right? Like, you loved Mr. Rogers. I love the neighborhood. I, I spent so many afternoons in the neighborhood. I, I was never into Mr. Rogers. I was a Sesame Street child. And, oh, I love Sesame Street, too. But my mom always... The thing that my mom always says is, you never liked Mr. Rogers because it was it was too boring for you. It was too calm and, like, too sedate, and it just didn't give you enough stimulation. Sure. Later in life, after having been diagnosed with ADHD... We maybe understand why yep. a little bit, mm-hmm. um, but um, I, I I think that 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 sort of sim- simple calm story or storytelling style just appeals to me a little bit yeah. less than there, than the sort of grander style of Lord of the Rings. I find the writing style of The Hobbit delightful in how laid back it is. Right. Like throughout the entire book, he will speak to you as the author and just say, eh, stuff happens. Right. You know, we're going to get back to his story in a little bit, but we're going to go do this other thing. Oh, and now we're back to Bilbo's story. So Bilbo Baggins is the main character. And he's a hobbit. He is a hobbit. Um, then we've got Gandalf, the Wait, wizard. Do we need I, to explain what a hobbit is? I, think I don't we might. think I don't think we need to explain what a hobbit is because I think everyone has seen Lord of the Rings. All right, if you don't know what a hobbit is, you should Google. They're hobbit. tiny. They're they, they're tiny. They got hairy feet. They're delightful. My D and D character is a hobbit named Greta Shortshanks. Yeah, she's well, she's a halfling. A halfling. I'm hobbit sorry, is trademarked, me. and Wizards of the Coast can't use it. Right. So yep. she's a halfling. Named it's Greta my understanding of it. If anyone knows more about that topic, email us. Yeah. So. The thing that, if we're going to talk about the characters, I don't really think we can go through and just talk about the characters. No, because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. So let's just break it down really quick. There's there's Bilbo, there's Gandalf the wizard, mm-hmm. and there's the dwarves. Right. And there's little characters we meet here and there. There's there's Smog the dragon, or Smaug. Smaug? Definitely not Smag. <laughs> so there's Smaug the dragon. There's Beorn the skin changer who turns into a bear. There's Bard the man. Bard the Bard the dude. Bard, the human dude. And there's a bunch of goblins. Yeah, there's lots of goblins. There's lots of... Um, <laughs> apologies to the McElroys. I'm a there's, goblin. There's, there's lots of goblins. There's... Um, um, there's eagles. There's eagles. There's spiders. There's lots of mythical creatures. There's, and there's... Oh, elves. elves. So many elves. A million elves. And... Bunch of elves. One other character, very important. Who's that? Gollum. Oh, we're going to get to Gollum. Who is a Gollum. I'm only going to say this right now. I'm going to say this once now. We're going to get to that. And I'm going to try to only say that once. Because every other time I've said we'll get to that, we don't. We we, we have done some self-critique on our previous podcasts. And one of the things we are trying not to do is say we'll get to that and then never get to it. Right. Yep. Um. So... <laughs> So if you've been thinking, if they do that one more time, I'm done. Don't worry we're about trying. it. We're trying. We're trying really hard. We're trying real hard. No, Gollum, no promises. But Gollum we're, we're going to get to. Yeah. So the thing about this story that I absolutely love is just how straightforward it is. When you compare it to the story of Lord of the Rings, um, which we can save for a future three-part episode. Really complex. Yeah. There's so many different storylines, so many different characters. The storylines intersect in interesting ways. The this Hobbit is, a is Hobbit's journey. This is there and back again, a Hobbit's tale. There you go. It's about Bilbo Baggins. Yeah. It is just about this one character and his adventure. And as kids' book go, that's wonderful. I love that. That's the thing I love about it. So we're going to keep that in mind as we talk about the two big adaptations of it that we're going to talk about. Right. Okay. Right. But as far as the book goes, what do you think of the book? Um, I thought it was a little boring. I- I liked Bilbo. Yeah, Bilbo's he's great. great. Yep. He's he he goes on a journey. Like mm-hmm. he like both physically, mentally, spiritually, like he is not the same person when he returns. And I like that. Like mm-hmm. I like I like a character that changes and goes on a journey. Um there are 14 dwarves. I found most There's, of them That's inaccurate. I'm sorry. There are 13 dwarves right. and Bilbo. Yep. Lucky 14. I found most of them indistinguishable. I do like the character of Thorin Oakenshield. Mm-hmm. I think that he is generally noble and interesting. Mm-hmm. I flawed, 
flawed, a flawed individual. Um, of course, Gandalf. I love Gandalf. Oh, yeah. He's wonderful. He's great. He's a wizard. He's wonderful. And I felt that the way that the sort of... I mean, the book is actually pretty episodic. Like, they're, they're on a journey, so of course there's that sort of through line, but there's sort of like... They keep encountering different things and then either defeating or being defeated by them. Right. And a lot of the book is sort of like... Bilbo gets into trouble and Gandalf comes and saves them. And Bilbo gets into trouble and Gandalf comes and saves them. And that started to get a little yep. repetitive. The one chapter that I can think of where I just absolutely... Here's what it made me think of. Mm-hmm. And knowing how religious Tolkien was, right. this makes sense to me. It felt like reading the Bible. Well, I mean, there's something to be said. I, I, I don't want to get too into this but there's something to be said for the dwarves as the jews going back to israel to reclaim their homeland oh, sure. and thorin as moses absolutely right? like, yeah definitely i mean i turned to you and i said the dwarves are middle earth juice uh and we we can say that we had a laugh over that yeah um but but i'm thinking of one thing in particular yeah okay so in the bible and i can only really speak to the old testament we're, um, we're i is this a good time to just Jews kind of, that we are. Yes, we are both We're Jew- both Jewish we are people. We're both Jewish people. So we can talk about the Old Testament. We don't really know much about the New Testament. So there's so much stuff in the Bible where it's just lists. And it's this person went to this person and they said we have 10 of this and mm-hmm. we have 20 of this and we have 30 of this and that goes on for pages. And there's a chapter in the Hobbit and it's when they meet Beor and the skin changer, the bear man. And Gandalf says, we can't all meet him at once. I'm going to introduce you all to him two at a time. Right. And he tells this sort of story. Over the course of pages, (laughs) Gandalf recounts to Beorn all of the stuff we've already read, but it's interspersed with, oh, here's two new dwarves. And Beorn going, that's, here's some dwarves. You said there was a couple, but this is four. It is the way that it's the way that it's the rhythm of that story is very biblical. It's very very biblical. Yeah, yeah, because because Tolkien was also like a biblical scholar. Yeah, but one of the things I appreciate about Tolkien, and there are many people who know a lot more about this than I do, but he was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. Right, right, and who was also a religious writer. They were both very religious, but they really were at odds about how they incorporated their religion into their writing. Right, C.S. Lewis was just like I mean the the I mean I the line the wish in the wardrobe is. Pure allegory. Pure allegory. Right? It's, I mean, Aslan, Aslan is Jesus, Jesus. And that is where, that's where it starts and that's where it ends. Right. Whereas the thing I love about Tolkien is that he uses the things that he's passionate about in his life to inform his stories, mm-hmm. but they are not allegory. Right. He was personally very against allegory. Oh, that's interesting. Like, yeah. like as an actual yeah. philosophical position, I didn't know that. He refused. He refused to. He refused to let people talk about the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings being allegory for anything. Interesting. There's so many people who try to look at it and say, "Oh, well, I mean, obviously the the." I mean, we really should say this for a future episode about Lord of the Rings, but there's a lot of people who try to say the depictions of war are directly an allegory for his experiences being in the trenches fighting for the British during World War One. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, that's not that's not what this is. This is a story about hobbits and elves. Right. That's that's not what this is. Right. He used those to inform what he wrote, and you can see a lot of his life experiences in his writing. But the thing I like is that it is not allegory. According to him specifically, it is not allegory. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah. No, I do like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, as long as we're sort of talking about general themes mm-hmm. or characters, this might, this might be a good time for my favorite segment. What's that? Which I know is also your favorite segment, <laughs> which is the female character is a little underwritten. Not too many ladies in this book. None. None. Not one. I counted. There were none. There was zero. Zero. So I guess there's not much else to say other than, you know... It's a flaw. Like I find it flawed. Yeah. Because, I mean, why couldn't some of those dwarves have been ladies? Yeah. There's no reason they couldn't. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I just... I, I And honestly, like, I'm going to say something kind of serious at this point, which which is like... Well, don't let's start now. I mean, right. Um... I, it is sort of an example of the type of thinking that 
the default person, I don't say human because there aren't that many humans in this story, Mm -hmm. but the default person is male. And they're always male unless there's a reason for them to be female. And it, it, it's something that you see a lot in uh, uh, literature, in movies, even up to today. Like, they've done studies that crowd scenes in movies are, like, 70% men mm-hmm. in the background. That, that you just, that they don't actually follow the demographics of actual society. Right. And, and that, that, that people are male unless proven otherwise. I guess is sort of the way that things tend to be and I'm not saying like any particular character would have been better written if they were a female character but it's just interesting because like well there's no love story in this book so why would we need women I guess is is kind of what it seemed like to me yeah and I mean you have to look at it through the lens of no one was saying why would we because right. it was just right of, of course I I, I'm, I I didn't mean we as in like yeah but you understand what i mean yeah um i mean that's tolkien was writing it from his perspective and he didn't write any female characters yeah that's that's where we're at i will say Mm -hmm. i will say on the subject of all male characters so this i'm gonna reveal something about myself right now um when i was a younger person college age human being something that i enjoyed very much was uh a thing called slash fiction do you want to save this until we're talking about the new movie no okay i don't okay um and for those that don't know um what slash fiction is is essentially stories about characters that aren't canonically in love with each other shall we say being in love with each other Mm-hmm. And so the first thing that struck me, you know as, where the you know where the term came from, right? Yeah, because it's like Kirk slash Spock. Like, those were the, those were the first two. I I, I know. Yeah. I, are you mansplaining slash fiction? No, to me? I'm I'm enhancing what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, so it's like one character slash another character, meaning like that's the pairing in the story, right? Um, so the first thing that I just I, think it's hysterical that Kirk and Spock were the first ones. I mean, of course they were. I think it's great. Why would they not be? Yeah. Um. So I have been and always shall be your boo. <laughs> okay. Um, and so I—I I mean, I'm not going to reveal my favorite pairing. Um, but I, my immediate thought was, there's got to be Bilbo slash Thorin fiction. I'm interested to hear how many you found. So I, I did—I did a little research. Mm-hmm. And there's a website called um, an archive of our own, which is like fan. Fi- it's not all slash fiction. It's okay. like fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be interested to know how many Bilbo slash Thorin fan fiction stories you think there are on that particular website, which is sort of the main fan fiction website on the internet. I'm going to say dozens. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. Well, that's true. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, there were 8,000. Jesus. 300. (laughs) That's a lot. That's just Bilbo slash Thorin. That's so many. I really appreciated that because my immediate reaction was there's, there is slash fiction in this relationship. And indeed there was. Uh, so we'll say no more about it. Wow. Um, but that, that, that pleased me very much. I just love, I love Bilbo as a character and I love Thorin as a character. I love the fact that Thorin is just so proud and so flawed. He's a really, he's just a really interesting character for a kid's book, I yeah. think. And I did, when we were watching the movie, I did yell, just kiss at the screen. I know you did. More than once. Yeah. Well, there's some, some implications. Um, I just don't know how much there else there is to say about the book. I, the thing I love about it is that it is very straightforward. Things are not revealed. Right. You don't find out stuff. It's Bilbo does this, then Bilbo does this, then Bilbo does this. And he goes, he has an arc over the course of the book. He is a different person at the end than he was at the beginning. Yeah, and and the thing about The Hobbit as a book is it doesn't, even though some of the characters cross over, it really doesn't seem to occupy the same universe as The Lord of the Rings. Like, a lot of stuff is is really different. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, even like Gandalf as a character is really different. Um, and so if you think of The Hobbit as a book, 
as a prequel to the Lord of the Rings, I, it doesn't really work. No. Nope. Which is maybe an interesting lead-in to the Peter Jackson Hobbit trilogy. It is, but it can't be an interesting lead-in. Because we have to talk about something else first. got to talk about other stuff first. Go ahead. There's two other adaptations we have to talk about before we can get to Peter Jackson. Go for it. Okay. In 1977, Rankin and Bass, two guys who'd made a bunch of TV movies, some you may have heard of, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I always found those movies really creepy. Yeah. So all of those stop-motion Christmas specials. Yeah, we didn't watch those. those. Were, I, watched, I watched those all the time. What were you doing watching Christmas movies? We celebrated Christmas until I was like 10. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, both of, your, both of your parents were Jewish. Yeah, only only my, Jewish. Yeah, my mom was Jewish. My dad wasn't. Anyway, after this, I'm sure this is really interesting to all of our listeners. Yeah. No, I bet it's, it's, they're interested in us. So... I totally watched those. I mean, the Rankin and Bass stop motions. The songs were all great. The animation was subpar, but they were they were a delight. Rankin and Bass decided they were going to do an adaptation of The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. They weren't going to do Lord of the Rings. They were going to do The Hobbit. And a few things uh, of note that I that I've found out. Um, they didn't do it stop motion. Obviously, they didn't do it stop motion. Right. It's like traditional animation. Exactly. Now, the company that they worked with to do the animation, I thought this was fascinating. It was a company called Topcraft. Okay. It was a Japanese animation studio. Their studio Ghibli. Oh. I, that's, yeah, I guess I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So this was 1977. Okay. They became Studio Ghibli in the mid-80s. But a lot of the same people that worked on The Hobbit eventually worked on Nausicaa and the, Va- uh, the Valley of the Wind and, and Princess Mononoke. Like, these were all... Th- that was Studio Ghibli. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah, so when you look at the animation style, it's it really... I never knew that for years, and watching it this time was a really, really fascinating experience. Mm-hmm. Here are some things that they decided to do. First of all, I'm going to say decided to do, but also maybe were forced to do. Okay. This was a TV movie. Right. So it was about, I mean, what was the length? Like about an hour and 15 minutes? Yeah. If that. I think it was like an hour, maybe a few, couple minutes longer than that with credits. Mm-hmm. And I will say this. This story works at an hour and 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. That's the Oh, th- yeah. No, it absolutely works. Mm-hmm. Like, it didn't feel like anything was missing. And we had just read the book. Yep. A to B. Bilbo leaves the Shire and holy ground there lives a hobbit. Dragon's dead. Bilbo comes back. Like it is there and back again. You can do that in an hour and 20 minutes. Well, it's funny because we got to the end and you what you said to me, I believe, was so we just got through the whole hobbit. The first Peter Jackson movie just started. Yep. <laughs> It's really, really amazing. Or no, actually, I think it was the other way around. I think we were about an hour and 15 minutes into the first Peter Jackson movie, and you said, the cartoon's over by now. Right, yep. <laughs> so I grew up on this cartoon. Yeah. And I think the cartoon is amazing. I love the animation style. I love the character design. I love the way Bilbo looks. The Gandalf, who is in the 77 Hobbit cartoon, is what Gandalf looks like in my head. Mm-hmm. I mean, now it's Ian McKellen. Right, of course it's Ian McKellen. But he's amazing. But the Gandalf from the cartoon is just so perfect. In fact, there's an edition of the book that I love. Um, That was actually one of the versions I would read a lot when I was a kid. And it's the one I remember my dad reading to me. It's this really big, like, coffee table hardcover. It's a picture book. It's full text of the book. Okay. But it's full of illustrations and test art from the cartoon. Mm. So those are the illustrations of it. That's awesome. It's really, really nice. It's And everyone should look it up. I don't even know if it's still available, but if you can find a copy of it, it's beautiful. I love this. It's short. They cut out so many different things. So, for example, Bayorn. Totally gone. Gone. Absolutely gone. And the story, the story does not suffer for it. No. Um, another, so there's really two things that I can think of that are really important that are gone. One is Bayorn, mm-hmm. which is big. But not important. Right. I don't think he's that important to the story. No, he, he really isn't. Like, he gives them supplies when they're going into Mirkwood. And mm-hmm. that's really... And then I guess he kind of shows up again later. I don't... Now I'm confused about which version is which. No, he shows up. It, he shows up, He right? shows up during the Battle of the Five right, Armies. that's what I thought. That's what yeah. I thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, as a bear. Like, as a bear. Right. I do remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's not, like, vitally important to any plot point. Yeah. But there's another big thing that they changed. Yeah. The Arkenstone. Right. So there's really, it's interesting, the way the book is structured, there's like 
MacGuffin after MacGuffin. Right. So the first... It's like Ma- the thing that they're trying to get. Exactly. So the first MacGuffin is we just have to get there. Right. And we have to kill the dragon. Right. That's the first MacGuffin. Or as they say in the cartoon, the dragon. The dragon. The do dragon. they say that? Yeah, they do. Oh, jeez. But then once Smaug's gone, then there's a whole other MacGuffin. Because that's not the end of the story. It's the Ark and Stone. And it's the Ark and Stone. So basically it's the, the quote unquote, the heart of the mountain. It's the crown jewel of the line of, of Thror. Of, uh, right. And all... then they throw it over the side of the Titanic. Yes. No, I mean, she's very old and she throws it over the side because she doesn't want the documentary crew to have it. Right. Yeah. That's That happened, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm now confused about all the different versions, well, no, but I'm I mean, pretty sure that happened. My favorite scene in, in the whole thing is when, I mean, basically... Thorin is like no Bilbo you have to save yourself and then he just sinks my favorite part is when Thorin and Bilbo are having sex in the back seat of the car <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Bates was so good in The Hobbit she's so good in it oh my god oh but basically my no so the Arkenstone is is McGuff is a MacGuffin in the form of a really really <laughs> shiny diamond I know our, it was a great joke it was a great joke I'm really proud of us okay go ahead so basically it's what sets off the whole third act of the book. Right. Um, Thor says, Thorin says, we got to find the uh, yeah, Arkenstone. Thor is a different thing. Thor is a totally different thing. Thorin says, we got to find the Arkenstone. And Bilbo's like, yeah, we got to find that, even though I already found it's it. It's in my pocket. And then he, like, gives it to the, he, you know, Thorin's being a jerk to the, the people of Lake Town, whose whole town was destroyed by Smog. And Bard, the guy who actually ends up killing Smog, he comes to them and says, you said you'd pay us. And I also killed the dragon so you can live under the mountain again. Please, can we have some money? And Thorin goes, no, because you're threatening me right now. And I'm not going to give money to anybody who's threatening me. I feel very me. attacked. And I need you to step back. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I mean, it's really, Thorin has his safe space. Right. Yep. And uh, you are violating my space. Exactly. You're in, you're in my territorial bubble. Right. So Bilbo says, uh, you know what? I don't like this. So I'm going to go ahead and slip away in the middle of the night with the Arkenstone. And I'm going to give it to Bard and the, the Elf King. Thranduil. That... Thranduil. 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 I'm going to give it to them. And they can use that to negotiate um, payment. And then war happens. And there's five right. armies. So, so not to put you find a point on it, but none of that is in the cartoon. None of it. There's the battle of the five armies, but the only thing they're fighting over is the treasure in the mountain. The treasure. It has nothing to do with the Arkenstone. Right. So right. that's gone. Okay. So we lose one, you know, I'd say fan favorite character and a pretty major plot point. Both of those are completely taken out and it still, it still works. It's fine. It's still great. It's fine. Yeah. And I think you should let that be a lesson. Yeah. To We're going to bring this back. Certain filmmakers... Who we love. Want to put every thought they've ever had yeah. into their film. So what thoughts did you have about the cartoon? Because I have a couple of things that I want to go over, but what'd you what do you think? Um, I I actually really enjoyed it. Um, listen, like I don't have a particularly strong attention span. So like an hour and fifteen minutes is great to me mm-hmm. to get through. Like it was kind of boom, boom, boom. Um, I thought some of the voices were really ridiculous. Um, Can I speak to the voices for yeah, a second? Go ahead. So a couple things that I found out. Um, so there is a who's who in this movie. In fact, I'm gonna look it up right now because I want to say who is actually in it. So Bilbo is voiced by Orson Bean, which I I'm just gonna say this: if anyone is listening who grew up watching Doctor Quinn Medicine Woman, look up Orson Bean because he's a delight. And he's great. And I thought he was such a wonderful voice in it. Uh, a couple of people. This this is one that I thought was great. So Han, Hans Conried. Is that the German fellow? No, it's not. Okay. Hans Conried plays Thorin. Okay. Here's a cool thing. Hans Conried was also Captain Hook in Disney's Peter Pan. Yep. Okay. Yep. And Elrond is voiced by Cyril Richard who is Captain Hook in the Mary Martin Peter Pan. Oh. So it's just Peter Pan all the way down. It's just Peter Pan. It's just full of Captain Captain Hook. Captain's Hook. (laughs) Captain's Hook. Um, Now, who is the the German fellow that voices the Elf King? Uh, Otto Preminger. Oh. Oh, Oh, yeah. I mean, like, this. he's a big deal. Otto Preminger's a big deal. Yeah. And John Huston is Gandalf. Right. Like, I mean, John Huston, he's he's Angelica Huston's dad. Like, he's, he's great. 
Um, so Richard is in it. Brother Theodore plays Gollum. No. Do we know anything about why this gentleman's name is Brother Theodore? It was just his, that was his thing. Is he a monk? No. No, it was just that that was his thing. Okay. Like he was, he was, he went as Brother Theodore. Why? I don't know. All I, right. Honestly, I looked and literally anything I could find about him was just like, oh no, we just take that as, take it as red. Okay. He's Brother Theodore. That's really odd. Yep. So the voice cast, I, sorry, I'm going to let, I'll let you go back to it. But yeah, the voice cast I thought was great. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was it was certainly uh, interesting. Um, no, I mean, I, I I did I enjoyed it like as as just as a plain piece of entertainment. Um, I thought it was great. I didn't think anything about it was like particularly memorable, necessarily. You just uh, you just put a knife in my heart. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just love it so much. I'm just saying I can't think of any one moment. How are you not still singing The Greatest Adventure? Oh, that's true. There were a lot of songs. I actually really did like the songs. The songs are so good. I, like, because that's... I turned to you and I said, is this a musical? Mm-hmm. And you were like, yeah, kind of. Yeah. No, the, the Rankin Bass songs are great. No, I, d- I did like the songs. I did mm-hmm. like the songs. Yeah, they're so good. No, just some things I saw about it. So, like, before the credits, so much exposition. Mm-hmm. Like... It, so much of the story happens. Bilbo's sitting there. Gandalf shows up. He says, we're going on an adventure. All the dwarves show up. Here's where we're going. We got to go get, we're going to the mountain. Yeah, it was like, boom, 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 The lonely boom, mountain. Boom, we, we Erebor, there's a dragon. We got we to gotta kill him. We got to get back our gold. Like all this stuff. You're a burglar. Here's, here's a contract. All that happens. Either and way. then the opening credits happen. Right, right, right. No, I, I like that. They get straight to the, straight to the point. And we have a thing sometimes that we say, and the movie just started. Yeah. And sometimes it's 10 minutes in and sometimes it's an hour. This time was 10 minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah, there you go. That's when the movie starts. Yeah. It's great. And basically, just we're going to come back to this too, 38 minutes mm-hmm. into this marks the end of the amount of story that's in the first chapter of the Hobbit trilogy that came out this decade. 38 minutes in, we get three hours of movie. Oh, right. Right, right, yeah. Because right, right. yes. basically the... The first movie ends when they're up the tree and the wargs and the go- and uh, the, yes. the orcs are and I will after. also say that is the first hundred pages of the book. Yeah, I, I I stopped reading. I was I was sort of reading in chunks, and I stopped reading at the end of the first movie, and it was like literally exactly page one hundred of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they made a three hour movie out of a hundred pages of book. Yep. So that's the cartoon. It's a it's I think a classic, and I think the people who love the cartoon like. Love the cartoon. I would definitely recommend if you like The Hobbit and want to watch it in visual form, start with that cartoon. I would honestly say if you love the Lord of the Rings trilogy and you haven't seen The Hobbit, it's the best version that I can think of other than reading the book of seeing what Bilbo's adventure was before The Lord of the Rings starts. Right. Yeah. No, I, yes. Because it's, it's very, it's got a very like Bilbo centric through line. Mm hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think it really works well with, with the Lord of the Rings, yep. with the the movie, the Peter Jackson trilogy. So yeah, no, I I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's another adaptation I want to talk about briefly, because we do everything briefly. Mm-hmm. And in the in the 80s, there was a comic book that was done of The Hobbit. Um, a guy named Chuck Dixon uh, adapted it, and uh, uh, an illustrator named David, named David Wenzel illustrated it. It's wonderful. I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. And you've read through a bit of it. I've read yeah, it a I million read, times. I didn't get through the whole thing, mm-hmm. only just for time. Did you have any thoughts about the first half that you read? Yeah, I I thought that it was kind of an interesting, having, having read the book, the full novel, having seen the cartoon, and having watched the three long movies, I thought it was a really good kind of distillation of the story of like if you did a shot for shot movie of that comic it would be like two hours and 15 minutes like it would be a a good two hour length movie at at the very worst three hours yeah right but it would be like one single movie Mm -hmm. and i thought they just did a good job of distilling the scenes down to the things that were important because obviously like with a comic you can't have like 
multiple scenes or multiple shots that you're showing the same thing over and over again Mm -hmm. you have to kind of keep going like you know like a storyboard because it's a comic strip um and i thought they did a really good job of kind of pushing forward but also differentiating the characters honestly i will say this the of all of the adaptations including the book itself that we have read the comic was the only thing one where I actually understood what was going on in the troll scene, I didn't realize it was Gandalf making the voices of the trolls. I didn't realize it in the book. I didn't realize it in the cartoon, the the animated cartoon. I didn't realize it in the Peter Jackson movies. Well, I finally read the comic strip and went, oh, okay, I understand what was happening. There's now. a reason you didn't realize it in the Peter Jackson movies because that's not what happens in the Peter happened, Jackson movie, right? But yeah. Like, that's what was supposed to be happening, right? Well, like, that's what happens in the book. Right. But I didn't get that that was happening in the book. I yeah. just thought that... Just for, for people that don't know what I'm talking about, because maybe... They, I mean, there's always a chance that for anyone listening that the only version of The Hobbit that you've experienced is the Peter Jackson trilogy. Right. When uh, Bilbo and the dwarves are interacting with the three trolls near the beginning... The thing that saves them is that Gandalf is go is hiding in the bushes and he's pretending to he's doing the voices of the trolls to get them to argue with each other to make them not realize how much time is passing before the sun is going to rise. Right, because they can't. They're like vampires; they can't be out in the sunshine. Because, like vampires, they turn to stone when the sun hits them. Right. The, that's what vampires do. Yep, we're gonna watch Dracula at some point. I'm gonna show you some stuff. I mean, I think. <laughs> think i know about vampires i think you probably do so the comic i just think is a wonderful piece of adaptation yeah i really really do and it does something that goes back to one of the things that i absolutely love about the hobbit it tells the whole story simply in one sitting yeah yeah and it's and it's clearly bilbo's story yep. all the way through mm-hmm so before we get into the trilogy, it's really important to me that I make this clear. Is this a disclaimer? This isn't a disclaimer. This is just my feelings. I'm stating my feelings. To me, one of the things that makes The Hobbit great and makes it great in a way that differs from Lord of the Rings is that it's a one-sitting story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To me, you're supposed to be able to sit down, experience the story of The Hobbit, and be finished in one sitting. Well, yeah, because part of the thing about The Lord of the Rings, and this is the way the books are written as well as the movies, like, at a certain point, the party splits up. Yeah. And so you have, like, maybe a hundred pages of just one story that you don't know what's happening with any of the other characters, and then you kind of go back and it's like... Well, while that was just starting, this was what was happening with these other characters. Mm-hmm. And the movie and the books are really set up that way. It's sort of chapter by chapter. Each chapter is a different, you know, group of people. Right. Um, especially once you get in, once you get into like the Two Towers and Return of the King, they're they're they're, they're separated, never to return together, really. But the Hobbit, you don't get that. It's I mean, there's one main character, yep. and it's. His story. Yeah. And like, sometimes Gandalf leaves, and then he comes back. And you don't know where he went, and that's You don't know where he went. All you know is there's one line at the end where he says, we were fighting the necromancer. Mm -hmm. I was meeting with the Council of Wizards, and we were fighting the necromancer. Which is like, now like an hour in the movie. It's like two hours. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. So, I just want to say, it is important to me that The Hobbit be a one-sitting story. And this was... This was, the, the, these this, three trilogies were made, I mean, we watched each movie in two sittings, so it was a six sitting story. Which is too many sittings. Too many sittings. I want to say a couple of things. I want to get your opinion on this too. Okay. I love Peter Jackson. I love The Lord of the Rings. I love those movies. And I don't want to talk about them too much because I want to do another podcast about The Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. I, I, I just will say that I think the Lord of the Rings movies, the trilogy, even like the director's cut, which is longer. The extended editions, yeah. The extended yeah. edition is 
an almost perfect example of adaptation because when yep. those movies came out, there were a lot of people who were maybe like Lord of the Rings purists, shall we say, that were really upset about one thing and another and like, well, they didn't have this or they did have this or, it, you know, it, it didn't show this right or this wasn't right. You could right. take my Tom Bombadil when you pry him for my cold dead fingers. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And my, my feeling about those movies is always those are as good... The, a movie is a, an, as an art form is different from a book as an art form. Mm-hmm. And you can't just take a book and throw it up on the screen. Like, it has to also stand on its own as a movie. And I feel like a mistake that sometimes people make as movie makers is you either don't deviate from the book at all, which then it's not really an interesting movie a standalone movie mm-hmm. or you deviate way too much and piss everybody off. Right. But I just feel like those movies are so, they do it so well as far as standing on their own self sort of self sufficiently. Um, if you I, didn't know anything else about Middle Earth, if you'd never even heard of the Silmarillion, if you'd never read The Hobbit. You could watch those movies. I mean, that's what I did. They could be your favorite movies. I mean, like, I feel like people who are super, super into the Lord of the Rings books should thank those movies for bringing people to to the books that might otherwise never have read them. Because I have read the Silmarillion, and I never would have read it. Mm-hmm. I never would have read all three Lord of the Rings books, plus the freaking Silmarillion had I not seen the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring and right. gone, oh, okay, I understand what hobbits are. Now I can picture it in my mind. Now I can read the book. All I'll say about the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I I will say two things. One, I consider them one movie. Mm-hmm. I, I don't consider them three movies. And two, that one movie is in my top 10 yeah. movies of all time. Yeah, I love them, love them, love them, love them. And I will watch the whole trilogy at least once a year. Yeah. The whole thing. The extended editions. Because they're wonderful. And Having we'll cover s- those in a future yeah. edition. Having said that. Yes. These, oh my god, these movies were a slog to get through. What I'd like good, to do. Good lord. Yeah, okay. Good lord, they were bloated. So I think it's important to talk about the stuff we liked. Okay. Before we talk about the stuff we didn't. Okay, all right. Um, I thought, I'm, I'm going to say one and then you say one and then we'll go back and forth until we're out of things that we liked. Love it. I'm going to, I'm going to pick a real easy one. Ian McKellen is one of my favorite actors of all time. Second, maybe third. He's in my top three. I mean, Ian McKellen is Gandalf mm-hmm. and he's wonderful. Mm-hmm. And I think that he is perfect as Gandalf in all movies in which he plays Gandalf. There's a scene at the end of the trilogy where it's just, it's after the battle. The Hobbit trilogy. The Hobbit trilogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it's after the battle of the five armies and it's just Bilbo and Gandalf sitting there. Thorin's dead. And it's just the well, two of them. spoiler alert. Dear oh, God. spoiler. I don't even think we need to say spoiler alert I'm anymore. I'm just saying. Thorin's dead. The battle is over. The scene between the two of them is, I think, as perfect as anything I could have imagined for a Hobbit movie. Yeah, he's... With Ian McKellen. No, he's wonderful. He's He's, so good. Yeah. Okay, now you do one. Well, I'm going to go ahead and say... I feel like I'm going to say... I need to say this because it's fair. Okay. It feels fair to say this because you just said Ian McKellen. Okay. Martin Freeman. Oh, no. He was going to be my next one. Like, I think he's great. I love Martin Freeman. I think Martin Freeman is very good in it. Yeah? I don't think he's great. But I don't, but think, I don't it's think it's his, his fault. fault. It's not his fault. Yeah. It's the direction. For years, after The Lord of the Rings came out, of course, when Lord of the Rings came out, one of my favorite shows of all time was The Office. Yeah. was The British Office. The British Office. Like, Martin Freeman hadn't been in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy at that point. He hadn't been in uh, Sherlock. Sherlock at that point. I knew, oh man, there's one actor I would love to see play Bilbo. Well, really, there's there's two actors I'd love to see Bilbo. Ian Holm 30 years ago and Martin Freeman now. Right. And then when the movie finally happened and they said, we've cast Martin Freeman, he was the only person we wanted to, to have for it. I was like, this movie's going to be great. I have the utmost faith because they made such a great decision. And then? Then I saw it and I was bummed. <laughs> yeah. But... Even though there are moments in the trilogy where I think his 
the direction he's getting is to play the character way more broad than he should be played, I still think he's wonderful. And, and honestly, like, I mean, we can talk about this, but, like, I don't even think it's a question of how he's playing the character. It's a question of how the movie is cut in a way that makes it not his story. We have to talk about that after we've talked about the things we like. I mean, that's totally fine, but I'm just I'm just saying that as in support of Martin Freeman. Yes. In yes. support of Martin Freeman, we love him. He's great. Yeah. Okay, so what about you? Um, I liked the dragon. I thought the dragon was very scary. Mm-hmm. And the the Sherlock to Bilbo's Watson. Yes, yes, indeed. So. The, the Benedict Cumberbatch voiced dragon. No, I thought the dragon was very scary. Like, I don't think there was anything non dragony. Uh, well, I will say he wasn't. Hmm. I feel like in the book, the dragon is just evil because he's evil. Yeah. And in in this, he it was almost more like he was insightful. He's like, oh, I see what you like, and therefore I'm going to hurt that thing because you you are, care for the people of Lake Town, and therefore I will kill them all. That's in the book, though. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, I didn't. No, I, I didn't remember that. Smog in the book is smart, but an asshole. Okay. That's the thing about Smog is that he's really smart and he's very insightful. He's not as smart as he thinks he is, and he's very full of himself. Right. Well, that I got. But he's not stupid. He's really no, I, not. I never thought he was no, stupid. No, no, but I just I, thought he was like purely evil. No, in in the it, he's made to be much more insidious mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the book, and that I think they captured in the movie. Yeah, no, I I like that dragon. So the dragon was great. Yeah. So what what else did you like? All right, there's one character that we've mentioned before, but I haven't really gone into, and I need to talk about him over the course of everything. Oh, I think I know who you're gonna say. Who am I gonna say? I think you're gonna say. Gollum. Okay, so Gollum as a character is important to me in my life because he is the single most terrifying character I've ever experienced in any work of fiction throughout my entire childhood. That's fair. I had more nightmares about Gollum than I ever did about the dinosaurs in Jura- the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park, the aliens in Fire in the Sky. What about the clown in It? Clowns don't scare me. Oh. Clowns don't scare me. They're jolly adults that exist just to bring joy to children. Clowns scare the shit out of me. Clowns are great. I don't like anything that has something that covers your face. Right. Gollum is ter- was terrifying to me. And he was terrifying to me through every version of The Hobbit that I experienced. He was terrifying to me. He was scary to me in the book. And then he was truly terrifying to me from the 1977 cartoon. Oh, yeah. When we were watching it, you like freaked out a little bit he is terrifying weird fish man bug creature like well as terrifying we know, he's like a deformed hobbit we know i know that now right, but, but like I'm saying, he like... was terrifying and then in the comic book he's like gross and purple and just just really really scary but that that vision of of Gollum from the cartoon haunted me for years it's one of the scariest things i've ever seen in a cartoon what I'm about to say is not about The Hobbit. It's about The Lord of the Rings. But I think it's relevant. It's hard for me to overstate just how terrifying I found Gollum throughout my entire childhood. Mm-hmm. And Gollum, to me, when did Lord of the, when did Fellowship of the Ring come out? It was like oh, Christmas 2001, right? Gosh, yeah, because I was still in high school. So it would have had to be like 2000. I think it was a freshman in college, yeah. so that makes sense. So Two Towers was, the, was Christmas 2002. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is weird for me that I can pinpoint exactly when Gollum wasn't scary to me anymore. And it was Christmas of 2002. Okay, all right. Because anyone who's seen The Two Towers, Gollum is... I mean, he's in the Fellowship for a minute. And like my experience of Gollum up until that point was he's terrifying in the cartoon. He is uh, terrifying in the comic book. He's really scary in the Ralph Bakshi version of Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. That's like really creepy. It's really, really creepy. So that those were the things that were in my head. And then he pops up in Fellowship of the Ring and you just see his eyes. Yeah. And it's like I the anxiety I felt in the theater at that point was overwhelming. But then in Two Towers He's so cute. He's he's terrifying and he's climbing down the rocks towards Frodo and Sam and they have their fight and I'm terrified. I am absolutely terrified. And then they get the better of him and they've got him down on the ground and Frodo has Sting and he holds Sting to Gollum's throat. 
and Gollum starts crying. And I wasn't scared of Gollum anymore. Aww. Because he was pitiful at that point. That's, and just that you had the same experience as Frodo did. Literally, in that moment, the thing that terrified me for 20 years wasn't scary anymore. That, like, I'm getting a little choked up because that's really sweet. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> that was my experience. So, Gollum, even though he doesn't scare me now the way he did when I was a kid, he still is so important to me because of how much he scared me. Yeah. And he remains one of my favorite characters in any work of fiction ever. I love Gollum. I love Gollum. I find him so fascinating and so compelling. So I I think it, I don't think this is crazy to say that Andy Serkis' Gollum is amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's a unique type of performance. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best realizations of a, of a character that you would have to struggle to bring to screen that I've ever seen. Right. He's amazing. Yeah. So... Can we please start talking about stuff we didn't like? No, not yet. So when we're in... When I was in the theater watching The Hobbit for the first time, and finally Bilbo is in the caves with the Gerblins. It's a Gerblin. And we see Gollum for the first time. I was so excited. Because Riddles in the Dark, that chapter, is one of my favorite pieces. It's one of my favorite like sections of any book I've ever read. I love it. I love it in every version I've ever seen. I love the riddles that they tell each other. I don't. I love it. I just I hate it's that It's very of, tense. I just hate that kind of riddle. Oh, I love it. I just think it's dumb. It's so great. So this I've is, never liked... I've never This is liked, a really good transition I've from the stuff we that, liked to the stuff we I didn't just, like, because I like it and you it, don't. It's nothing, well, it's nothing to do with the movie. I've just never liked that kind of wordplay. Like, I just think it's dumb. Well, I, I don't know what to tell I you, because it's great. I just great. remember, like, when I was a kid, you like, in, like, elementary school, you used to get these, like, little worksheets that you had to fill out that was, like, just like that, and it, I just never liked it. I feel legitimately bad that that is what it conjures for you. I feel really bad. Well, maybe they should have like read us The Hobbit instead of giving us dumb worksheets. I would say so. Yeah. Riddles in the Dark is one of my favorite things ever. It's wonderful in the car- it's wonderful in the cartoon. It's wonderful in the comic book. And it is per- nearly perfect in the Hobbit trilogy. Mm-hmm. Because I get to see Andy Serkis again. I get to see his Gollum again. And I get to see a version of the scene that I've read for years but interpreted through the Gollum that I experienced in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right, right, right. The, the weird, the Gollum that has two personalities that are warring with each other. Which is like totally like a creation of Peter Jackson, right? Mm-hmm. Like a, it's a not. A creation of Peter, it was, I, from my understanding is it was really a creation of Andy Serkis. Okay. It was something Andy Serkis did. But it's not really like in the book. No, but he's saying the lines from the book, but he's giving it the reading of these are two characters. Right, right, these right. are two personalities. Right. And it works. Yeah. It absolutely works. And without going into all the detail of it, you know, the entire Gollum storyline in The Hobbit ends with Bilbo having the chance to kill him. And he doesn't. And he looks at him and he pities him and he doesn't. He just jumps over him and escapes. Which is like kind of your story if you pitied him. Exactly. That is done perfectly in The Hobbit. And the look on Gollum's face, you just pity him. Right. He's not terrifying. He's well, pitiable. Because because he like kind of starts to cry. Yeah. Yeah. Because his ring has lo- has left him. He can't find his ring. He can't find his, his I mean, birthday like, present, what precious. If you, what if you couldn't find your dog? Yeah, I know. What Absolutely. If, what if, Thankfully, my dog doesn't make me evil. No, no. Your dog just makes you go take a lot of pictures for Instagram. <laughs> right, exactly. Hashtag off-brand dog. So, That's a good plug. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Another plug for me on the thing that I make. So I will say Gollum Riddles in the Dark is great. I'm trying to think of other things I loved in it. There are moments, there's one more section that I just want to mention briefly. Mm -hmm. When the dwarves and Bilbo are in Mirkwood Forest and they're fighting the spiders... Oh, I, I mean, I can't even speak to that because I covered my eyes. Your eyes time. were closed the whole time. I don't like spiders at I, all. I also don't like spiders, but I will say... That I would hold up as the best scene in the entire Hobbit trilogy. I just thought it was funny because you said to me at the time, well, there's, what do you do in Return of the King? I was like, I cover my eyes. I don't like spiders. <laughs> but I think it's so good. I also don't like spiders, but they're just, they're talking and they're silly. But like, I really don't like spiders. That whole scene I thought was great because they, they made a really interesting change. Because in the book, when they're in Mirkwood, there's this implication that it's a very confusing place. But then in the movie, 
they go all out with that. And it is like a, they're like walking through an M.C. Escher forest and they are going crazy the longer they are in there. Yeah, and he's like, we've come this way before. Yeah. And they drop something and they find it again and all this stuff. I legitimately loved that. Yeah. I thought that as an interpretation of, as an adaptation of that scene, that whole chapter, I thought it was perfect. And then when they fight the spiders, I thought it was beyond perfect. I love that whole section of the Hobbit trilogy. Can I can I talk about something that I really enjoyed as a human being, although as a an adaptation critiquer perhaps was not so great? What's that? I really like the sexy dwarves. <laughs> they were really sexy. Now we have to get to the things that I don't like. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Let's do this. Okay, so there's a bunch of dwarves. So uh... and some of them look like dwarves. And some of them look like sexy people. Yep. And never the twain shall meet. Yep. <laughs> All right. I want to I backtrack for a second. Because you, you hadn't seen these until now. No, I had not seen them at all. I saw these when they came out in the theater. I was looking forward to these movies for years. I'm sorry. One thing that we're not going to talk about is what happened behind the scenes. Okay. That's fine because I don't know at what least happened behind the scenes. not at length. I will give a brief... Here's a brief, brief synopsis. There was always a plan to make The Hobbit... There are like two big things that I can think of, really three. There's three things that I can think of that really have to do with the behind the scenes stuff. So I'm just going to cover them in a minute. Go for it. One, the rights to The Hobbit were not as clear cut as they were to Lord of the Rings. Hmm. Um, New Line Cinema released Lord of the Rings. It's owned by Warner Brothers. That was pretty cut and dry. The problem with The Hobbit is that the distribution rights were also owned by MGM. Okay. And so there was a really big lawsuit that went back and forth. So for a long time, it wasn't even sure whether, whether there was going to be a Hobbit movie because MGM was fighting New Line Cinema and Warner Brothers. And it was a whole like thing. I feel like I kind of remember that one. Yeah, talking. it was a whole thing. Eventually it made because the right people got the money that they wanted. So that's, that's number one. Number two, wasn't going to be directed by Peter Jackson. Right, you, you told me about It was this. going to be directed by Guillermo del Toro, who is a, a filmmaker who I have a very interesting relationship with. <laughs> When I love him, I adore him. When I don't, I it bums me out because I, I don't love him a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. But he was going to direct The Hobbit, and it was going to be two movies. Right. Then he dropped out because the development process, I, I don't know. I really can't speak to it. So then there was a question of, well, who's going to take back over? And I remember there being a story that Sam Raimi was going to take over. But then Peter Jackson stepped up and said, you know what? I'm not going to produce it. I'm going to direct it. Right. I did Lord of the Rings. It falls to me. I'm going to direct it. I will take the ring to Mordor. I will take the ring to Mordor. Though I do not know the way. (laughs) Good pull, babe. So. (laughs) And as it turned out, true. Oh, my God. So basically, we go into this experience. Peter Jackson's directing it. Cool. I love The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is great. Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens are co-writing it. I think they are fantastic. They're so good. They're so good. Like, not... Not given enough credit, screenwriters. No. no. I, I, I think that Peter, I mean, I, I you know, listen, I don't want to say anything about Peter Jackson as a human being. I think, well, we don't know anything about him as a human being, I but we think, can talk about him as a filmmaker. I think those two women are the brains of the operation. <laughs> I bet you would agree. <laughs> He's the energy, they're the brains. Yeah. The energy he brings, I don't think The Lord of the Rings would have ever happened without him being the energy behind it. Yeah. But in terms of the writing of it, yeah, I would say a lot of that was Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens. Yeah. Um, especially when you find out about like how much Philippa Boyens loves Lord of the Rings. and it, Anyway, that's, that's for a later episode. That's for, yeah. So that's number two. Peter Jackson takes over. Number three, it was just supposed to be two movies. Oh, dear. An that Unexpected been, Journey. God, that would have been great. And, their inva- and uh, The Desolation of Smog. And then it gets announced, you know what? We're going to make three movies. Three three hour movies. But it's not even that they took the two they were making and evenly split them into three. They said, we're going to take the second movie and split that in two. It's too many movies. So this goes back to my... It's too many of them. Oh my God, it was too many. It's too, too many. This goes back to what I was saying originally. The Hobbit is a one sitting story. It is not a three sitting story. Because remember I said to you in between like the first and the second movie, I was like, how, when did these come out? And you were like, oh no, there was a year between them. Yeah. And I was like, I don't understand. Like it's not, it doesn't come to an end. Like mm-hmm. it's one, it's a 300 page book. Mm-hmm. Like, like let's be clear. It is a short novel. 
a, th- a, th- a thin paperback, and it's apparently nine hours of content so there was a there's a line i'm gonna bring up right now that became like the thing that we continually continuously referenced while we were watching them so for anyone who's seen the movie the birdcage (laughs) i'm gonna explain this quickly because i don't think you can explain this joke i can explain this joke it's gonna be great go ahead so essentially (laughs) all right i'm not going to explain it for those of you for it. those of you that have seen the birdcage when robin williams son val is saying we got to redo our whole apartment so that the really conservative uh, politician doesn't know that my parents are a gay couple He's, in florida he says, we have to get rid of everything that's over the top and hank azaria as the guatemalan, see now you're over explaining it as but i'm, I'm just over explaining the one quote as the guatemalan maid goes that's a lot that's a lot yeah <laughs> But there's this great line that's oh, repeated. Oh, I thought that was the line we were No, going. no. Oh, I'm sorry. No, there's a great line that's repeated in the movie when people keep bringing things in saying like, I found this moose head across there the street. Goes, that's what go. they like. I found it. And Val just goes, don't add, <laughs> only subtract. Don't, he doesn't say only subtract. He, he just, just says, says don't, don't add. add. That to me is the essence of an adaptation where right. you're going from a book to a movie. Don't because add. Because the I can't say this as a rule, but the best adaptations I have ever seen book to movie the movie is a distillation of the book books can do more in the time they have than a movie can do yeah the hobbit well, is th- i mean think about it like even the shortest book like think about an audiobook version i mean even the hobbit They're hours ou- hours like, hours the like, hobbit audiobook is 10 discs there you go there which you go. i listened to for the very first time right, it's great what, rob what ingles is, that, is like, fantastic like 10 hours right it's more than 10 hours yeah like 12 13 hours something like that like that's ugh. yeah even the shortest book just reading it out loud is longer than you think is so what i'm saying bottom line don't add right don't add this is the perfect example of someone who did not take that to heart. Well, so the yeah. Hobbit trilogy is the story of the Hobbit, plus way more. Yeah, it's the story of the Hobbit. Uh huh. And it's the story of Thor and Oakenshield. Yep. And it's the story of Gandalf. Yep. And it's the story of Bard the Archer. Bard the Archer and the politics of Lake Town and, and the, Radagast and the, the Brown math, and Radagast the Brown and his bunnies. Oh my God. And Stephen Fry and Albert. Oh, Alfred. Alfred. <laughs> Alfred. Oh, Lake Town. Goddamn Lake Town. It's and awful. And Lake Town's politics. Ugh. <laughs> and... Let's, let's just walk through them. Okay. So the first movie starts. <laughs> right off the bat, I was mad in the theater. Okay. Because the whole first movie starts off with... It's... Okay. You know what? I have a better way to say this. Here's, here's a better way, to I think, to distill what I, what I see the, the problem being. And it's really not a problem so much as is, as it is a potential disagreement between us and the filmmakers. Okay. It is very clear that the filmmakers made the decision while they were making this that this has to tie in as closely as possible with The Lord of the Rings. Oh my gosh, and does it. Oh my god. So the whole trilogy is bookended with Ian Holm. Right. You see him the day of his 111st birthday. And Frodo. Frodo's and I, in it. And I said to you, wait, did they just use footage from Lord of the Rings? And you were like, no. Oh, they got Elijah Wood back. And I was like, what? He's not in the book. Yeah, not I mean, in that, the book. That was what I, I mean, if I had one criticism for the entire trilogy. Which you don't, but go on. Well, I, I do, I'm just saying, if like you could distill it down to one thing. Yeah. Was the fact that I kept yelling at the screen, you're not in the book. <laughs> go away. Yep, pretty much. So they do as much as they can to tie it in. And I get it. Because I get why they thought they needed to do that. Peter I just Jackson, disagree. Peter Jackson, as a filmmaker, is trying to make a prequel to his film, The Lord of the Rings. Right. And so they're trying to pull all of this other stuff into it so that you could sit down and watch it and have a continuous experience. Mm-hmm. But if you read the book, you can't have a continuous experience. It's not the same. It's truly not the same world like the world building is really different so i'm gonna get i'm gonna get really high level here for Sorry, a second I just got really like really emotional about that i know i'm gonna get really high level and emotional here for a second okay, go ahead. i cannot say that this was the intention of the writing of the books i can i can't even say that this is a common interpretation of the books mm-hmm. i can only say that this was always my interpretation one of the things I loved about The Hobbit versus The Lord of the Rings is that The Hobbit is always, that's a kid's book. Right. That's which a is kid's what my, book. Which I grew up hearing my dad say that. 
The thing I love about the Middle Earth stories, if you look at those four books, The Hobbit and then the three Lord of the Rings books, I've always seen them as a metaphor for growing up. Aww. So The Hobbit is childhood. Yeah. It's an adventure. It's big and it's broad and it's only about one character. And it's fun. And it's fun and funny. And yes, things that happen in it that don't always make sense. But it doesn't matter that much because you're a kid. And it also doesn't matter that you don't understand the implications of everything that's happening because, like, you're a child. Like, exactly. And you're just looking at it through your own eyes. Think of Bilbo's experience during the Battle of the Five Armies. Right. It's, he's like, a, just, it's like a child. He's just watching it. He goes, I don't, I'm not, I don't really. I hope no one gets hurt. Yeah, like in the movie, he's like, is this a good place to stand? Yeah. 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 Which is really sweet. Like, I really liked that. It is really sweet. So I just love that aspect of it. Another thing that kind of goes along with that is the fact that the bad characters are bad. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's it's black and white. It's it's very very black black and white. And there's only one character in the entire book who has kind of both, and that's Thorin. Yeah. Only one example of it. But then you grow up and life becomes the Lord of the Rings. And the negative emotions and the negative motivations are in the people you love the most sometimes. And there's women in it. And there's women. That's the thing. It's a bigger world. It's more complicated. It's darker. The stakes are higher. And no one is watching the action and thinking, oh, this is, I'm just going to stand outside this. It's a world where you have to have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. And you have to defend the people you love and the world that you love. Well, I think that's really insightful. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Someone's going to email us and say, yeah, that's a pretty common... That's a pretty common interpretation Listen, of these. I love him and I think he's smart. Thank you. I love you too, sweetie. So Aww. that's always been my interpretation. Now, if I were to look at what a good movie of The Hobbit would be, given that interpretation, through the lens of that interpretation, for me, it needs to honor the differences between The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, not try to erase them. Right. And that's something that this trilogy fails to do for right, me. Right, it's trying to like, it's really trying to um, make those bound, like blur the boundaries between the Hobbit and Lord right. of the Rings. It's trying to make it all. It's trying to kind of jam it together into all one like universe. Well, it's doing two things. Yeah. It's adding things that weren't in the book to try to make the story more more cohesive. Yeah. And really, that's defined by Gandalf's whole story. Right. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, uh. Ooh, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, Kate Blanchett. Galadriel. Galadriel. Yep. The Galadriel is like a major character. Yeah. And we've got we've got Saruman on the way. We've got Radagast the Brown. Radagast the Brown. Elrond. We've got Battle Elrond. We've got Sauron, who is not in the Hobbit at all, except like vaguely referred to as the Necromancer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a whole story. I it's mean, in we've all got three movies. Radagast and his bunnies, which is totally made up. Yeah. Radig- it's just so, it's so weird because oh, Radagast is like the most he's so appropriate for a kids movie yeah but the scenes he's in are the most mature scenes in the whole yeah, trilogy yeah it's like really creepy that he just suddenly like pops up oh my god it's can ridiculous. I tell you a quick story about Radagast sure go for it um okay so when my brother was really little my dad had asked my, he was interested in reading The Lord of the Rings. And yeah. my dad was like, no, you can't read The Lord of the Rings. You're too little. Like, you should read The Hobbit. How old was he? I mean, like, maybe nine. Okay, gotcha. Um, I would agree with your dad. Yeah. He was like, no, no, I want to read The Lord of the Rings. And my dad was like, I mean, okay, but, like, you're not going to get it. And so he, like, gave him the book, and he went away, and he read it, and then he came back, and he was like, I read The Lord of the Rings. And my dad was like, no, you didn't. And he was like, yes, I did. Like, quiz me on it. And my dad started asking him questions, and he started talking about Radagast the Brown. And my dad was like, I mean, that's such a minor character, and he's mentioned on, like, one page. And I'm just really impressed that you, as a tiny child, like, clearly read this book and understand understood it enough to know who Radagast the Brown is, and therefore... You clearly read this book. Exactly. Universally uh, recognized as a minor character. Yeah, exactly. Like, that was the thing that he had taken away from it. And he, like, didn't know that it was such a minor character that it didn't matter. And, mm-hmm. But he had clearly read the whole book. Yeah. My brother's pretty smart. Yeah. I mean, bottom line, the whole... The idea that that story needs to be part of The Hobbit yeah. is there only to serve 
tying it in with Lord of the Rings. So, but I was going to say, so it's two things. Yeah. One is that they introduce, they add plot elements to tie it in with Lord of the Rings. Yes, indeed they do. But they also try to make the story of The Hobbit more dramatic on the level of The Lord of the Rings. Right, 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 right. Like, so it's, yeah, it's just like the stakes are really high. Like, yeah. It's like the world is ending. And it's like, well. Is it? Is it? Yeah. And, and it's. Like, and oh no, the dwarves might not get their gold. Oh no, they might not get it. And like, they, they, there were, I mean, there were a couple of moments where I was like. I hate you because you're making me cry right now, mm-hmm. and I know what you're doing to me, and this isn't right. <laughs> like, I know I'm being manipulated. Like, all of the scenes with Bard and his children, yeah. like, he just kept being separated and reunited and separated and reunited, like, four or five times. And it was like, these children aren't in the book. Why are we, why do we, why are you making me care about these children? It would be so easy for me, I, as much as I, I can in life, I try not to say that a movie's bad. Yeah. I can hate a movie, but that doesn't mean it's bad because right. so many people work on these things and they spend so much of their lives well, that's making really it. that's a really thoughtful and open-minded attitude to have. I don't always succeed, but that's what I try. These are movies especially where it would be very easy for me to say that they were bad, mm-hmm. but they're not. No, they, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh and Philippa Boynes, they're talented. Oh, some of the screenwriting is sublime. Oh, like, so good. Some of the scenes, there were, there were one or two scenes that I thought were just, like it just upset me that they were so good, that the dialogue <laughs> was so good because I was just mad that they were just like in this movie. Yeah. Because <laughs> I didn't like the movie. Ugh. There's just, so if we kind of walk through all the trilogy... The fact that it tries to be Lord of the Rings, I just find a mistake. Yeah. I, I find that to be a really big mistake. And, but I think that's just like the underlying thing because that is what it is. Mm-hmm. Like there's, it, you, you, can't, you can't divorce it from the fact that it's trying to be the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So in the spirit of don't add, let's talk about some of the things that they added or enhanced, shall we say. Can I say the first one? Please. So, there is a popular character from the Lord of the Rings films that is not in The Hobbit. Ooh, who would that be? Um, That would be an elf named Legolas. Legolas the elf? Legolas the elf. Well, here's the deal. So you're, you're telling me he's in the movie. He is a major character in these movies. It really is crazy. Like, I was really... I was like, oh, okay, a cameo. This is fine. And I knew he was going to be in it. They announced he was going to be in it. That's fine. Here's a cameo. Can I just say? (sighs) Sure. And not only is he a major character, he has a love interest who is an elf named Toriel. How? So I'm going to ask you a question. She's very pretty. How do you... She's very pretty. I have a proper crush on Evangeline Lilly. How do you feel, given your observation of the lack of female characters (laughs) in The Hobbit... How do you feel about, is this a case of you going, there's not enough women in The Hobbit? And then they say, well, here you go. And you're like, oh, no, but not like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's pretty but, accurate. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> that's not what I wanted. I just want, like, a dwarf to be a lady. Yeah. Um, no, they add some ladies. I mean, Gladriel's in it. Toriel's in it. But anyway, sorry, back on Legolas. There are some Lake Town women. Legolas is in it. Orlando Bloom's great. They had to do some sort of CGI thing to his face. I think they just I to think to make him look younger. Or I think perhaps it, he had Botox. I think it was literally just like the digital version of Vaseline on the lens. <laughs> I think they just smoothed him out a little bit to make him look. Um, in, but interesting because he was fact, a child when they made the first one. No, he was one. like nineteen. Like, yeah. listen, listen, uh, no shade on Orlando Blue. Like, no tea, no shade, no pink. He's a very age. attractive man he's at any age. Very attractive man. Um, I did think it was really interesting that he's like three years older than the gentleman who's playing his father lee pace is wonderful yeah i love him um but yes that was that was great lee pace is very dramatic he's very but he's he's great him yeah. doing that is great i had no problem with lee pace as, i had well here's my favorite thing about lee pace as thren thranduil thranduil um he rides a war moose it's it not a moose it's a moose it's not a moose I it isn't it's like a reindeer elk kind of thing. Moose, not a moose. The moose is my spirit animal. <laughs> which is which is a bummer because that's not a moose in this movie. I like the warm moose. But I love you. <laughs> so you've got Toriel, who's played by Evangeline Lilly. And listen, like she's I mean, added. She's added, and I like I I I find it hard to find it in my heart to dislike 
her or her character because I just think Evangeline Lilly is very pretty. She's very pretty. And I enjoyed looking at her. Yeah. Throughout the film, mm-hmm. I I really liked it when she was on screen. Yeah, except for the implications and the story. I and... mean, except for the fact that like we can only have a lady character to be a love interest for another character that also we're kind of making up out of whole cloth and also suddenly he's sexy except that he's a let's, dwarf okay let's talk about dwarf boyfriend for a second dwarf boyfriend okay so dbf so basically it's feely and deep and his brother dbf yeah um dbf dwarf boyfriend is Ex- an extremely attractive dwarf dwarf um and again, when we're not again, but like when we when we use the term dwarf, we're using it in the Middle Earth context. Oh my God! Yes, like not in the offensive like little person. Little person. This is the Middle Earth context. Yeah. And in the Middle Earth context, dwarves look like John Rice Davies in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Right. They don't look like this dude. They don't look like dwarf boyfriend. Dwarf boyfriend. He's very handsome. He's very handsome and very sexy. He just happens to be a little bit short. He's a little bit short. And Evangeline Lily is not that tall for an She's elf. She's actually for an elf not that tall. She really isn't. So there's this whole love story that's added. So I will say for me there's two aspects to this. Okay. One, I am completely af- just offended from a story perspective that they added a love story that to me adds so little to the overall story. Like nothing. Like but why? She... Why do we need someone? Like, because in the in the original text, Feely and Keely die. Yep. And it's sort of there's like one sentence that they're like, "Oh, they fell in battle." Yep. And it, it it seems like there's an implication that we not only do they need like a storyline in order for us to care about the fact that they die, but like someone needs to be in love with one of them yeah. for us to care about the fact that they die. And I guess we'll just make up a, a badass female elf warrior princess. Mm-hmm. I've heard some really, really cynical analyses of adding Toriel and the love story to this. Because what I've heard from some people is they've said, the studio just wants a love story. They just want a love story because that's what women like. I think that oh, is... Oh, I don't think anyone I was with... making this with women in mind. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I, I really... And well, I don't like, know about that. If I really, only... I, if only someone had said, we're putting something in this movie because that's what women like, yeah. that would have been better. I really get the feeling that the filmmakers, Peter and Philip and Fran, our friends, I really get the feeling that they thought that this was the right thing to do. So, that's a problem. It's not even worth getting that far into. It just doesn't need to be there. Don't yeah. add. Don't Just add. Don't add. It doesn't need to be there. Can I write a note? Can I read out a note that I had written? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> this is like a sort of a series of notes. Oh, good. This is These are my notes directly from my notes. Yep. Uh, During one of our six sittings. Yeah. Uh, really hate that they made Legolas a character. There's a lot of really stupid shit in this movie. <laughs> Please just kill everyone so we can go home. Jesus. Legolas is only in this movie to do dumb bullshit. (laughs) He does a lot of dumb bullshit. Which is weird because in Lord of the Rings, he does a lot of badass bullshit. I I know, but there's so much dumb bullshit in terms of like the fighting sequences in this movie. This movie, I don't know what happened when they were storyboarding it, when they decided on what the action was going to be. But there is some dumb bullshit in this movie. It is really... It's just silly, but not silly in a fun way. No, it's silly, silly in, in a way that way. just takes you completely out I of mean, it. How many times did I turn to you and go, that was really stupid? Like so many times. Many times. Many, many times. Um, and I felt that way. So I, can I go back to what, what it was like for me in the theater watching yeah, this? Yeah, go ahead. I was just so bummed. Mm-hmm. So I watched the first one in the theaters three times. I wanted to give it chances. I really wanted to give it chances. And then the second and third one I saw once in the theater both times. This is the first time I've rewatched them since the theater. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say, like, just for context in terms of your movie watching habits, like, it's yep. really not unusual for you to see a movie two or three times in the theater. No, so I do that like, all the time. It's not like this was super unusual. Yeah. And you, you saw it three times. It's, like, it, yeah. yeah. It's one of a couple of times in my life where I've gone to see a movie, not liked it, and thought, I got to give it a second chance. <laughs> it's one of only a couple of times. And I gave it a second chance, and I liked it even less. And then I gave it a third chance, and I kind of liked it. That's, 
Okay. And I kind of liked it. I finally it was like, no, there's stuff in it that I like. And I really got to focus on like Ian McKellen's great. Martin Freeman's great. Riddles in the Dark, Gollum is exactly what I wanted. I like the sexy dwarves. The dwarves are very sexy. Richard... Yes, but some, the, the weird thing is it's only some of them. Yeah. It's only like three of them. Well, let's... So I think this is a big thing. So the dwarves... My feeling has always been... The dwarves don't need to be characterized individually. Except for a couple. Thorin is important. Mm-hmm. Bomber, the big fat one. He Although, gets, literally, like, literally, his only character trait is that he's fat. Yeah, but at least he's separated. At least he's separated from the rest of them. Yes. I don't think we're body shaming Bombor. <laughs> like, and Feely and Keely are important because they're the nephews of Thorin. Exactly. But beyond that, Balin and Dwalin a bit, but the rest of them are just and, there. And, and Glowin is Gimli's dad. Gloin. Glowin. Yeah, which they dad. absolutely bring up. Yep. To Legolas. I actually it, liked that a lot. I hated that. I liked it so much. Hated it. No, I liked it. Oh, I hated it. Um, yeah, there were two references in this trilogy to the Lord of the Rings. One was Legolas inexplicably being told about Gimli. And then was Legolas inexplicably being told about Aragorn, which I hated. I hated that. Ugh. Well, it was Gandalf being told about Aragorn. No, it was, was it Legolas', Legolas being dad told saying, go find this strider. And what his real name is, he will tell you himself. Ugh. Yeah, that was awful. I hated that a lot. Yeah, I really I hated because that Because there was too. no reason for it. Because Legolas was like, I can't go home. And there was no reason for it. Don't add. Don't add. Don't add. So basically, the dwarves are weird in this movie. I think Richard Armitage as as Thorin is great. He's fantastic. Can, can we talk about something that we had talked about with What's Thorin? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Are so, you talking about his gray streaks? Because he's real sexy. No, I but I really like his gray streaks. And like I can only hope that my hair looks like that as I grow older. Yep. Um, no, this is, this is a serious thing. Sure. Um, so something that happens to Thorin... Is that we we are given to understand that the the lure of the gold and the treasure and especially the Arkenstone drove his father mad and eventually killed him. Yep. And something that we see with Thorin is that his character really really changes once he sort of is in in the thrall of the Arkenstone. Are you talking about the book or the movie? The movie. Okay. The movie. Yep. Because in the book that happens too. It happens too, but it's really, really emphasized in the movie. Yeah, but it's emphasized in a different way. Right. And, and we're told he's sick. He's sick. He's That's sick. it. Because in the book it's just a character development. Right. But, but, but we're specifically told this is making him sick. And the fact that he's sick, as, as described in the movie, is really driving a lot of his decision making. Poor decision making. Um, and I, I think it's really problematic to be presenting, I mean, like, if we're going literally by what we're being told by the movie, he, he's mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And A, that's sort of being presented to us as character development. Like, people are saying, well, the Thor and I know would never do these things. It's like, well, if he's sick, then he would. Like, that's not, if you're, if you're ill... That's that's not a reflection on your character. Like you're you're ill, so you can't sort of have both of those two things be true at the same time. I think I said this to you while we were watching it. Mental illness is not a character is not character development. It's not character development. Like it's just it's mental illness and it's it's sad and it's hard and like, you know, we all know people who have struggled with 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 mental illness mm-hmm. and and it's not a character trait and it's certainly not a character flaw. Like I think I think that was the thing that was really upsetting, which is like, you should be strong enough to resist this, which in the movie, it's like, he sort of suddenly decides not to be sick anymore. Yeah. And suddenly he's not sick. Real problematic. And and that's just, it's just upsetting. Like Mm -hmm. it's, it's just upsetting that it's being presented that way because it doesn't have to be that way. That's not how it is in the book. And even if it were, I, 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 I think it's, I think it's wrong to present I think it's wrong not to look at that critically and say, what I'm actually saying here as a filmmaker is that if you are mentally ill, it's totally possible to just suddenly have a burst of strength and decide not to be that way anymore and to go and do the thing that everybody's telling you you should do. Like, 
that's that's upsetting. It like, is. I, I I I myself. This is not something that I've struggled with myself, but like I can imagine, like if you were someone that loved the Lord of the Rings, but also struggled with with whatever mental illness. Like I can imagine sitting in the theater. That would be a really hard thing to have to kind of sit there and swallow. And that's it would feel like I, I feel like it would feel like the movie wasn't wasn't made for you. Like in the same way, I often feel like movies aren't made for me as a woman. Like in this. In this world, in this world in 2017, um, it, I, th- I think, it, yeah, that's that's all. That's all. I, I, I just think it's upsetting, and I think as a filmmaker, um, it's irresponsible to portray what is clearly mental illness that way because you say, they say that it is, and then they portray it in an irresponsible yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I have to say about that. That is, it's a complicated thing. And I think that really speaks to, if we had to distill it down and say that there's a couple of big problems with it, that really speaks to what I see as being one of the biggest problems and something we've talked about. Who is the main character of the book, The Hobbit? Bilbo. Who is the main character of the cartoon version of The Hobbit? Bilbo. Who is the main character of the comic book? Bilbo. Who is the main character of the first movie of the trilogy? Bilbo. Who is the main character of the second and third movie? Thorin. 100%. Yeah. And it bums me out. Thorin is a supporting character in this. This is Bilbo's story. And this, I think, speaks to what we were talking about in terms of trying to make this the Lord of the Rings version of The Hobbit. Yeah. Because the Lord of the Rings has a lot of main characters, all with different arcs, all in their separate stories. That's not The Hobbit, though. The Hobbit is Bilbo's story. Yeah, yeah. It's not Thorin's story. Yeah. So they're trying to turn, they're trying to turn Bilbo, Gandalf, and Thorin into Frodo, Aragorn, and... Boromir. Boromir. Well, Boromir's not a great... Gimli? Gimli. I don't know. Yeah, Gandalf. I'll Gandalf. say Gandalf. Yeah. But like Gandalf in The Hobbit is not Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. No, he's still like a totally different character. A lot less stuff that's going on with him. And Thorin is not like any of those characters. He's there to help Bilbo go on his journey. Yeah, and sort of tangentially get what he's looking for along the way exactly and then he dies yeah and there's another aspect to the, this whole trilogy which is that there's a bad guy there's a couple of bad guys well there's a big one that sauron. is well sauron is the necromancer he's kind of in it smog is in it yeah but then there's also azog oh right there's azog the white orc which is not in the book well he is there is one line that references him and i think it's i have to look at it again but i think it's like azog the destroyer not azog the defiler as they refer to him in the movies okay they they said we gotta have a villain we gotta have someone who's gonna be in all three movies that's someone who's hunting thorin no need yeah if well if it's bilbo's story azog does not need to be there well there's another bad guy who's the other bad guy the master. I don't want to talk about Lake Town politics. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. It is awful and <laughs> stupid. Stephen Fry. And I love Stephen Fry. And I also love Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens. But I don't want to talk about Lake Town politics. It was so stupid. You could have removed 90 minutes from this movie. Like, the master of Lake Town is in the book. And he's corrupt in the book. And he's corrupt and, and he's an asshole. The, and that's know, it. That's, that's done. It. That's done. And in the movie, it had to be a I whole mean, honestly, plot point. I, I don't know. I actually think that the Bard storyline was far more bloated than the Master storyline. But both of them put together was a lot. There's too much Lake Town. Yeah. There's way too much Lake Town. Bard doesn't have to have kids. The whole... Alfred is... Oh, who's that? Like, I feel so bad that I'm going to say this about this character, given that I don't know the actor who plays him. And yeah. I'm sure he's a delightful man. Alfred is one of the dumbest characters I've ever seen added to an adaptation he's of like anything. He's the Jar Jar Binks of The Hobbit. He's He makes Jar Jar Binks look subtle. He's awful. And I, no, he's not awful. I just hate him. I hate Alfred. Can I say something I appreciated about Lake Town, though? What's that? Because we got to wrap this up. Okay. We gotta ra- We have to wrap up part one. Okay. Because we're going to have parts two and three of this podcast That's coming out soon. That's a joke. We are not. It's, I'm deadly serious. No, you're not. Um, I made the decision that this is going to be a two-parter. This is a one-sentence appreciation. Not everyone in Lake Town is white. No, that's true. It is It is somewhat multicultural. A little bit. There's Although that... everyone with speaking words is light. Is, whoa, That's that came out wrong. Go back. Do you want to say it again? I sure do. Everyone... With lines is white. This is true. Everyone 
in this movie. And I know it makes you uncomfortable to try to, like dissect race a little bit Does it, what are you talking about well we've done this previously you've said it doesn't make me uncomfortable it's just i'm white so it's hard for me to dissect it i think i can say i i don't want to i don't want to sit here and pretend that i understand the experience of someone who's black or I, asian watching I, these movies because i don't know i don't know that either but i think i can say absolutely objectively every single person in all three of these movies with spoke who emits spoken dialogue is white other than i believe there are some uh maori actors who play orcs yes the azog is maori I yes believe. um and i don't um, i, I don't want to no i can't no he's not i don't want to minimize i don't want to minimize that but yeah. like they're, they're in a lot of makeup like yeah. do you know what i mean <laughs> every, every every visible human being <laughs> Who speaks lines in this movie is white. Just tangentially, that's another problem I have with it is so many CG. Like, I love Billy Connolly. <laughs> Why was he CGI? I don't know. Like, he was so just So Billy Connolly CGI. plays Dane. He plays he plays a relative of Thorin who comes with the dwarves from the Iron Hills. And he's CGI the whole time. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. This whole thing was... Let's wrap this up. I want to end really quickly. I, I want to say one last little thing before I let you finish about this. Go ahead. Just about the movie itself, about this trilogy. Because mm-hmm. one other thing is we watched, we didn't watch the extended versions of these. Oh, God, it, no. it, it kills me that like there are extended versions of <sighs> what we too, just watched. It's too much. It's, it's too much it's movie. It's too much movie. There's a, a whole side of the internet that I've been into for a really long time that I don't think you and I have talked about very much, and that's fan edits. And there are two versions of this movie that I found that are four, four and a half and two hours long, respectively. Okay. And it kills me that someone can sit down and say, no, I can turn this nine hour movie into a two hour movie. I can do that. And I've watched it. I've watched parts of it. But how is it? This is not bad. <laughs> it's really not bad. Like there's there's some stuff that they can't really fix because it's kind of ingrained in the plot of the trilogy. Like there's not much you can do with the with the dwarf boyfriend storyline because it's just there. Yeah. But there is a shorter, more fun, faster paced, faster paced I mean, we adventure really movie in here. We haven't talked about the pace of this movie. Some of the scenes, like the individual scenes, are so slow. It's weird. It's yeah. a weird movie. But anyway, there was one thing you wanted to say. Yeah, so when I was reading The Hobbit, um, I act- I highlighted one line because I thought it was very prescient. Is that how you pronounce that? Prescient. Prescient um, of, of Tolkien and really applicable to sort of like where we are as a society today. So this is what it says. It's talking about the, um, the dragon, mm-hmm. Smog. Uh, and the line is, his rage passes description, the sort of rage that is only seen when rich folk that have more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but have never before used or wanted. And that just made me think of sort of everything that's going on in politics today, like in terms of people like examining their own privilege and like equality and rights for different groups of people and... It, it, it made me kind of sad. I guess this isn't a happy note to end on. Sure isn't. It, it just, it just made I was me really of, looking forward to ending this on a happy made, note. It made me kind of sad because I was like, no, that's it. That's it. That's it exactly. Like, that's that's white privilege right there. Like, that's the patriarchy. Like, it's people who have never really thought about what they have suddenly feel that someone wants to take it away from them. And even though they never cared about it before now they're getting salty about it and and i was just like yeah i i have a new sort of metaphor for what that looks like and it's a dragon like with its body curled around its giant masses of gold with tiny tiny people on the outside going um could i just maybe have one of those um and it made me feel sad <laughs> that wasn't uplifting at all that it wasn't uplifting but that at was all. that was the biggest thing that i came away with from from the, the book the hobbit the most uplifting thing that I can say is that we don't have to watch it anymore. That's true. And we get to move on to the next no, thing. No, I, I, I feel bad saying that because there are parts of it that I love so much. I, and I have so much respect for Peter Jackson. I have a lot of respect for Because I love The Lord Fran of the Rings Walsh so much. And Philip of uh, what, Boyens. Bo- Boyens. They're just so wonderful. Yeah. And I, there is, I'm not sure I have a lot of respect for Peter Jackson at this point I, in time. I know how we can end this on an up note. Okay. I really believe that this trilogy is worth watching. 
I really do. I think there are moments in it that make it worth it, that really, really make it worth it. I would advise anyone to watch these movies. I would never tell anyone not to watch them. Watch them once. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not saying watch them every Christmas. Get, get drunk and watch them once. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, it, that's a fun time. <laughs> or just watch the cartoon. No, watch, watch them all. all watch right. them all. I love The Hobbit. It's so good. Anyway, that concludes this episode, which uh, rightfully so is an extended episode. Maybe we'll, we'll work on getting our episodes a little bit shorter. Let us know what you <laughs> we think. We have a lot to say. Let's talk about letting us know what to think. So you can find us on the web at adapterparishcast.com. You can email us at adapterparishcast at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at adaptcast. We'd love to hear what you have to say. If there are things you'd love for us to cover, let us know. If we're wrong about anything, please let us know. Um, I, I would even rephrase that. Let us know about the things we know we were wrong on. We know we were absolutely wrong about many things, and please let us know. But also, if you have ideas for future episodes, please let us know that as well. Yeah, we'd love to hear your opinions about The Hobbit, because I just, I love The Hobbit so much. In a hole in the ground. I, there lived a Hobbit. There lived a Hobbit. It's just so pure and so wonderful. Bye, everybody. Bye.